I'm going to start with um, the statistic I just saw this morning at 8.30, um, that 2.1 million additional Americans are out of work, bringing it to a total of approximately 40 million out of work in 10 weeks, which I know we, we this is probably the most overused word right now, but this is unprecedented. We have never seen anything like this. But for those of us who have lived through the 2008 financial crisis, I thought that is a a good recent um, downturn in the economy to look at to compare what we might have going forward. And just to give some some you know quick reference, you know if you remember back in the 2008 2009 financial crisis. You had household United States names like GM, Chrysler, Washington Mutual, and IndyMac file for bankruptcy. Uh, in addition, you had bailed out by the federal government um, AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Citigroup. And you had uh, companies such as Bear Stearns, Wachovia, and CIT just simply go under. And those were all just to name a few. I think the comparison and the contrast to the 2008 financial crisis and today, at least in the United States, is the the swift actions being taken by the Federal Reserve in acting as a lender of last resort to central banks, to municipalities, for mortgage lenders, to corporations. Uh, back in mid-March, if you look at some of the articles that are out there, the credit markets uh, were effectively seizing up, but the various Federal Reserves around the United States started lending money, uh, and and the Fed really stepped up big time so that you didn't have the financial institution crisis that you saw back in 2008. Um, so, so far, what have we seen in, in the past two to three months as far as restructuring and bankruptcy is concerned? I just had scribbled out on my pad next to me that I'm looking at. You've seen, again, household and international names such as Neiman Marcus, J.C. Penney, J. Crew, Hertz, Tuesday Morning, Gold's Gym, Models, Pure One, and just overnight at Vantage Rent-A-Car, which is an affiliate of Hertz, I believe, out of Canada. They've all filed restructurings, and in the past 24 hours, you have Amtrak, Boeing, and American Airlines all announcing enormous layoffs, and American Airlines CEO um, coming out with a pronouncement that we will not file for bankruptcy again. So with that, I think we are at the tip of the iceberg, uh, looking at who filed for, for bankruptcy and restructuring back in 2008. Who's filed so far? I think the the economic havoc that's been wreaked um, will be, have a lasting effect for months and years going forward. Um, in addition to the United States Federal Reserve, I believe you've also seen uh, world um, uh, central banks also step up big time and and making sure international credit markets have not frozen up. So that kind of broad, you know, overview, uh, I would open it up. I, I could either, you know, go to Howard and talk about additional um, United States measures uh, to help out the United States economy. If Howard wants to join about the, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, if he's ready, or we can also go internationally and talk, get get the sense of, of our international um, perspectives both in Europe and in South America. Well, Ray, it's Howard. I, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Let me talk for a few minutes about the CARES Act or the Payroll Protection Program. I think this is a good segue to talk about that because I want to address some of the provisions of the law, some of the things that the law protects, and some of the things that are excluded from the law. So let me start by talking about it. Uh, the PPP program or the CARES Act was passed by Congress to address the economic fallout from COVID-19. Congress initially offered, made available about $3 trillion 
in coronavirus relief in four separate measures over the last two months. And remarkably, there is another uh, bill in the House of Representatives that's been passed for an additional three trillion dollars. Now that's very controversial. It hasn't been hasn't gotten to the president. He said he's not going to sign it. So there's much yet to be done about that. But basically, under the PPP program, it makes funds available of up to ten million dollars in loans under various criteria for to to address certain borrowers' needs. And what's interesting about this law is, first of all, it doesn't require any collateral and no personal guarantee. So in many respects, it's relatively easy money to get. The borrower must be a small business concern or a business with no more than 500 U.S. resident employees. An important restriction on the money is that it has to be used for payroll, payroll taxes, and health care benefits through June 30th, mortgage interest, rent, and utilities, and interest on certain pre-existing debts. To get the money, though, you have to, it limits the amount of employees you can lay off and, prohib- and, and limits the reduction in hours you can impose on employees. The loans come from the, are funded by the Small Business Administration <clears throat> and administered through banks where the applicants make their application. And what's most interesting about this statute is the loan is forgiven if the borrower complies with the rules of how the money must be used. And the best practices here are as a borrower gets the funds to deposit the money in a segregated account, don't com- do not commingle it with other funds, pay only permitted expenses, and maintain scrupulous accounting in to ensure that you can prove you properly use the funds. If, however, it turns out you don't comply, the loan must be repaid within two years at a ridiculous interest rate of 1%. Another fascinating part about the law is that it does not impose debt forgiveness income on the forgiven debt. In other words, there's no income tax charged at the federal level if the money is borrowed, retained, and not repaid. There's a whole laundry list in the statute of businesses that are not eligible. And I just want to touch on a couple of examples of ineligible businesses. Uh, Congress decided that it was not going to make these funds available for businesses who are engaged in the live performances of a purient sexual nature. So Congress decided no strip clubs, sex workers, or in some cases sexual therapists were allowed to access these funds. So there's some cases that are out there. One is the Silk Exotic Gentlemen's Club, which is a strip club in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which did get a favorable ruling from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals that upheld a temporary restraining order to require the SBA to process a loan application. And there's other court rulings in other states that have been have uh, similar outcomes. Another area that's ineligible are anybody who's engaged in a business that's illegal under federal law. So that excluded all of the cannabis industry. But certain states are providing funding where cannabis is legal. The hemp business, which is related to cannabis, does qualify because under the 2019 Farm Act, the federal government um, legalized uh, industrial hemp. Another kind of business that's not eligible is one where the owner of 20% or more of the company is incarcerated, on probation, on parole, or subject to an indictment. Or within the last five years, the applicant was convicted or pled guilty to a federal crime, to, not sorry, to any kind of felony. So in other words, criminals need not apply. So what happens if a company is in bankruptcy? Can it apply for the funds? And the answer to that is no. One of the exclusions is a company, a debtor in possession in Chapter 11, is ineligible to apply for PPP funds. But to date, at least a dozen lawsuits have been filed by bankrupt debtors across the country to seek access to the PPP loan so they could restructure in bankruptcy. And there's a wide variety of outcomes Texas and Vermont bankruptcy courts have granted temporary restraining orders to force the SBA to make funds available. The bankruptcy court in New Mexico actually ordered the SBA to fund a loan. Bankruptcy courts in Delaware and Kentucky refused to grant a TRO. And right now, the current trend seems to be against forcing the SBA to accept applications. But there are cases pending in the, interestingly enough, the Diocese of Buffalo, the Diocese of Rochester in New York. And cases in Oregon, Puerto Rico, and Arizona have have issues pending. 
In one of my cases, I encountered an interesting issue. The debtor's in Chapter 11. It's ineligible to apply for a PPP loan. It moved to dismiss its bankruptcy case, applied for the PPP loan, and is now going to refile Chapter 11 with the PPP money. So we'll see how that works. Now, one of the important changes that the CARE Act did does change the bankruptcy code. So in early 2020, subchapter 5 of, of chapter 11 came, became effective. And basically what that did is it's a provision of the bankruptcy code that streamlined chapter 11 for small businesses. And to be a small business under the law when it went into effect in February was you had to have less than $2.7 million in debt. The CARES Act actually increased the $2.7 million to $7.5 million which means there'll be a substantially larger number of smaller businesses filing Chapter 11. It's much less expensive under the new law, and I think you're going to see a flood of those smaller businesses filing. So a couple of interesting issues to think about. Are PPP funds collateral for a pre-existing secured debt? And I recently, in representing a creditor, sent a letter to a defaulted borrower demanding the turnover of the PPP money, and they haven't written us a check yet. We'll see what happens. Are PPP funds cash collateral in a Chapter 11 that the debtor cannot use without court permission and without providing the secured creditor with adequate protection? I don't know. We'll find out as that issue starts to work its way through the courts. Now, we've all heard about retail, restaurants, and hospitality industries in trouble. Ray made a good observation a few minutes ago, and I want to touch on that. This morning's Bloomberg, the headline, Big Bankruptcy Sweep the U.S. in the Fastest Pace Since May of 2009. And they point out that in May of 2020 alone, 27 companies with more than $50 million in debt each filed Chapter 11. So think about what industries are going to face a wave of filing. We know about the obvious cruise ships, airlines, two of them have just, Avianca just filed, and I think uh, one in, Another one in South America just filed yesterday, but we have the obvious. But think about other industries that are impacted by those industries. And I think in terms of the supply chain, the trucking industry, food suppliers to restaurants, we know the dairy business is in trouble. Municipalities are going to be filing because they are losing tax revenues. Also, consider how our personal habits have changed during this time and kind of ask yourself, what if we continue to live the way we're living now and forsake a lot of the work, a lot of the industries and businesses we enjoyed before. What's the impact going to be on them? So I think the bottom line here is on the PPP grown program, it's very helpful, but I think there are systemic problems in our economy that are going to result in a substantial number of Chapter 11 filings and attempted restructures. Some are going to work, many will not, and I think businesses and industries are going to change dramatically as a result of what we're dealing with today. Ray? Thank, thank you, Howard. I couldn't agree with you more, Howard. Um, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, I thought it'd be a good time to, to get an international perspective. Ivan or Francisco, do either of you want to um, throw in a few comments about what's going on and what you're seeing? Sure. Um, I can start if you want, Ray. Um, thanks. And um, just to remember you um, that I'm from Argentina. I'm a partner with San Jorge Lambinas in Argentina. And, uh, and I, I want to say a few words as regards um, what is happening with, with the whole business of restructuring, insolvency, and distress money in the region. And um, I, I, I must start by saying that the situation in the region is not that good. Um, some of our countries were struggling with economic difficulties in December 2019, and then the pandemic hit the region. So the situation now it's um, it's uh, it's complicated. Um, then and this, I mean, it's um, it's easy to explain because we have almost the same situation all over the region. Most of our countries entered into, into mandatory lockdown in mid-March, and, and we are still in that situation with um, postponements in every, every 15 days. So 
um, as a consequence of uh, both things, um, the situation that we had in December and, and the lockdown, lots of industries started experiencing financial difficulties, which in some cases, um, I think it's, it's obvious that will lead to bankruptcy um, in some others into at least restructuring or, or reorganization procedures. Um, as regards our governments um, in the region, the government um, granted a minimum help to different sectors with um, let's say cheap credit facilities and some aid in salary payments, but in many cases it is not enough. So we are in the middle of a huge crisis and many companies will, will go bankrupt. Um, above that, I think that um, we also have to mention that in, in all of our countries we have almost no judiciary power. You know, our courts are closed and only working on, on an exception basis. Hence, um, we, we almost have no bankruptcy or insolvency processes going on. So they, I think that they are mostly stopped um, in, the, in, the, in the last weeks. Our Supreme Court stated that lower courts should be resuming processes to the extent that they are able to do so remotely. Um, and, and notwithstanding that we are in a recess and there are no due dates, which is sort of contradiction. So we, we, we will see what happens. Um, and on top of that, um, it is rumored that, that the government will m most likely be issuing some decrees banning the possibility of going bankrupt before the end of this year, um, posting reorganization procedures. Um, and, and, and this is a situation that it is mostly shared um, all over the region. Um, for example, in Brazil, there's a bill of law which, which has preliminary approval that states some rules aiming to prevent insolvency as well as some interim measures and amendments to the bankruptcy law, um, basically with automatic 30-day stay, um, no enforcement by creditors available, and, and no acceleration um, of uh, loan agreements and agreements. So, um, having said that, um, and as I mentioned some weeks ago when, when teaching at a seminar with clients and, and, and financial advisors, um, I think that there are, there are plenty of opportunities in these times in the region. Um, first one, I think it's, it's a good moment to restructure. For example, if you have a heavy debt, you might be eligible for a subsidized facility and, and exchange expensive debt for cheap one. And, and there's no need to be in financial trouble. I mean, it's just planning and being smart. Um, second one, if you are, if you are, I mean, in, in financial trouble and you just can get more credit to exchange for the old one, uh, then it might be a good opportunity to restructure banking that, um, you know, at least our experience by these days is that banks are more open to discuss restructuring under the current situation. Third opportunity that I see is that with, uh, with the current situation, it might be a good idea to fight for restructuring procedure, which is similar to Chapter 11, um, because I think it will help by gaining time. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, and this is something that is happening all over the region, um, all of the bankruptcy and restructuring processes will probably be stopped till the end of the, of the year. So 
there will be no pressure from from creditors. And and then that's the fourth opportunity that I would like to mention. Um, and that is that there are and, and there will be uh, more opportunities in the field of distressed MA. I mean APAs, even traditional MA. We are seeing some movement in those fields currently. So um, just to finish, I think that um, we are in the middle of the perfect storm for sure. Um, but however as sad as it may sound, I think that there are huge opportunities for bankruptcy lawyers and and I foresee and I see in our case here uh, work flooding, I mean uh, um, and, and it will be flooding in the coming months too. So I think that that might be a short introduction to, to what is happening in the region. And as I said, this is something that is happening in Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia, um, Brazil. So um, we, we share mostly the same situation and probably the same difficulties, right? Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, Ivan, what what are you seeing from uh, Europe? Do you have any observations well, um, no, uh, to share? Yes. Um, regarding uh, the Europe, um, I think that the, um, we have very similar situation for, for from what you were talking about. Uh, Europe generally and uh, is trying, I think, to suppress this crisis. Uh, the similar way uh, uh, it is fighting the coronavirus to try to slow down the the, the, the flood. Um, so some countries, some bigger countries in Europe, introduced moratoriums in in um, um, initiating bankruptcy proceedings. Uh, they, they also made some exemptions uh, in this respect for the companies that are hit uh, by coronavirus and they uh, provided uh, certain deadlines for, for uh, this moratorium. Um, so Europe is trying to um, ease for these companies that are distressed at this moment and to try to avoid the peak of the, the bankruptcy uh, um, as uh, as much as possible. Uh, I think one of the um, most affected industries uh, uh, is tourism. Uh, the pandemic caught Europe uh, just uh, in preparation for a new touristic season, for summer season, uh, and uh, most of, of um, um, European countries uh, GDPs uh, um, are pretty much contributed by tourism industry. We have stuff from from five percent until uh, to twenty five percent, such as Greece, Croatia. Um, so uh, I think that, particularly in this uh, field, uh, the, the bankruptcies are not going to start yet, or organizations. Uh, because it is not yet certain whether the season will happen or not. The borders are still closed. The moment of people uh, is just charting the, because the pandemic is, is slowing down. So uh, countries are uh, just starting to, to open the borders for some nationals. Uh, and... Uh, I think by the end of June, it will be clear whether uh, this particular industry will, will you know, generate some money to survive at least until the end of the year. Uh, for example, France already announced the, the, the 17 uh, billion euros of package for um, emergency helping uh, the, the, the tourism industry in that country. Uh, and France is number one in terms of, of tourism. It had in 2019 about maybe more than 90 millions of, of tourists coming to, to the uh, country. 70% uh, of these tourists were 
actually from abroad, not domestic choice, but uh, from from other countries. And uh, uh, the tourism there generates ten uh, percent of GDP. Uh, so this will be uh, quite interesting. Still, I think uh, nothing will happen in next two or three months. Uh, until the summer is over, because everybody will try to survive uh, this summer and to generate as much as as, as possible. These uh, countries that are mostly dependent by, uh, of uh, tourism industry are starting to open borders uh, more quick, quickly than the others, such as Greece uh, has already opened their, its borders to to uh, the um, regional countries and uh, from some countries of uh, European Union. So, um, I guess that uh, by the beginning of 2021, we will have first, as, as Francisco said, uh, I think it will start with reorganizations. This is similar with Chapter 11 in the U.S., um, whether, you know, in pre-packaged reorganization uh, form or through the bankruptcy. Uh, and then I think after that, quickly we will have uh, um, the companies going full, fully into bankruptcy. And I think this will create, a, it will be, uh, as, as Francisco said, a perfect storm, but I think after this storm, it will be a sea of opportunity. Um, and that, uh, you know, the, the, the tourism field will start to um, rebuild uh, quickly, and uh, that uh, investors will show their interest in, in, in investing in those distressed businesses uh, through the bankruptcy or organization, and that uh, you know it will uh, come to the, the, the some normal level of. Of operation throughout the Europe. Ivan, before before I leave you, um, I mean, do you see I mean, do you see tourism in Europe starting anytime soon? I think I heard you say, you know, maybe beginning of 2021. But if that's the case, how is anybody going to survive in the major? Uh, tourism spots in Europe? Uh, some countries are still trying to, to save the season, 2020 season. For example, uh, Greece uh, will uh, allow tourists uh, from June 15 to come into the country. Uh, for some countries, uh, they will require no, no uh, particular condition to, conditions to enter the country. Um, other countries will start maybe later in July, uh, but still, Mediterranean Basin is quite dependent on, on uh, the tourism, and uh, I think that uh, these countries uh, will try to, to ease the measures against uh, the COVID quickly as possible. Um, however, on the other side, we have Italy and Spain, which are um, quite heavily uh, impacted by by uh, the pandemic, and uh, they are a bit more cautious than these other uh, Mediterranean countries. So I think they will try to salvage the, the the season as much as possible, and that's why I think it will be delayed. Uh, the, the, the restructurings and bankruptcies in Europe will be this still will be a little bit delayed than the other industries. Well, thank right. you, Ivan. I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, Ray, turn just, out to Chris. Ray, um, just to jump in, just yep. to jump in for a second, and I can see, I mean, Chris has been so patient. I mean, he looks fantastic, his jacket on, he's smart. <laughs> but, you know, the anticipation is building. Um, but while, while we have Ivan, Ivan on, we're just going to build that anticipation for Chris that's a little bit longer. We, we've had a question come in um, on the theme of tourism and bankruptcy. Um, 
and this is clearly somebody that's picking up on a point that Francisco made about opportunities, which is, Ivan, do you believe that now is a good time to look on the market to invest in tourism? You know, can we expect bankruptcies within the hotel and, and, and other industries, and therefore, uh, if you've got those deep pockets, um, is is this a time to be looking to be looking to invest? I guess like like any investment, and without any crystal balls, there's always an element of of gambling. Um, but but how would you how would you address that question? Um, yeah, um, I, I agree that this will be at this still at this point of time. It will be a uh, a kind of gambling. But yes, uh, the investors should be you know tracking the situation because, uh, as I said, Europe is very much dependent on, on the tourism and uh, it has very well developed um, infrastructure for that, hotels, restaurants, uh, and other like, leisure um, sector, uh, they will become attractive uh, and uh, the investors should uh, look at, at these uh, these uh, sectors to invest, but I think still it is not a uh, right point of time because uh, the pandemic is not yet over. You still have these measures introduced; uh, they're still in place in some countries very strictly. They're trying to to they're actually starting to to uh, ease these measures, but. Uh, I think maybe a month, uh, we are a month away from, from uh, seeing this picture a bit more clear. Okay, so yes, potentially, but, but watch, watch and wait for now. Okay, hey. thanks, Ivan. Back to you, Ray, and hey. over to you, Chris. If I could just chime in on that point, um, I, I, I'll offer the counterpoint of what I've seen um, and actually, you just saw it in the past couple of days where Carl Icahn sold his almost $2 billion stake in Hertz and got out of the business. And you also saw Warren Buffett sell all of his interests in, in all of the airlines um, shortly after the shutdown in the United States. So while there's opportunities out there, I think you see some of the the – most well-known investors, you know, worldwide, also looking at this very, very cautiously. So I thought I'd throw that counterpoint out there. And a good point to make, Chris. I think this. I think the floor is yours. I think you've earned it. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Ray. And hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to speak briefly today about commercial real estate and retail, uh, and the theme is. Uh, the public health crisis has exacerbated pre-existing vulnerabilities. Uh, with respect to retail, we're seeing a growing divide between those retailers that are positioned to succeed in the new normal and those that are not. Uh, the two driving factors here are uh, shifting consumer spending habits and highly leveraged balance sheets. Uh, Government-imposed lockdowns and uh, social distancing measures have shuttered some brick-and-mortar operations, many brick-and-mortar operations, uh, forcing layoffs and some bankruptcy filings. Uh, some commentators have noted uh, that the public health crisis has accelerated trends that were already occurring. Uh, many consumers are already shifting to e-commerce, and the public health crisis has meant that that shift has gained traction. Uh, many retailers are already uh, burdened by costly debt and highly leveraged capital structures. Uh, now those retailers that are unable to generate the revenue to service that debt may have no recourse but to file for bankruptcy. By contrast, some retailers are thriving. Uh, the shuttering of rival stores, uh, stimulus payments, all seem to have benefited some larger retailers. Omnichannel retailers, for example, are those retailers with the scale to sell their wares through multiple channels, uh, through websites, through social media, through physical stores. Uh, these omnichannel retailers are able to take advantage of the shift to e-commerce while still offering hands-on shoppers a physical marketplace. Uh, successful examples include Walmart, Home Depot, uh, Amazon, etc. Industry insiders expect omnichannel retailers to continue to gain market share. Uh, after all, in the new normal, consumers may find that uh, e-commerce is just too convenient to abandon. 
Uh, looking forward, I think we can expect highly leveraged retailers uh, that are dependent on brick and mortar operations uh, to seek bankruptcy relief. Uh, if they're unable to generate revenue uh, to pay for operations, it, administrative expenses, and restructuring, uh, the likely outcome uh, is asset sales uh, to strategic or opportunistic buyers. And so that would be the opportunity we see uh, coming is for distressed asset buyers. Now, struggling brick and mortar retailers in turn has a downward effect uh, on the commercial real estate market. Uh, many retailers are struggling in the public health crisis, and even as uh, restrictions ease, uh, they find that they're only able to operate partially and that they need to cut expenses accordingly. So you see even large, stable businesses like Starbucks taking a fairly aggressive position with their landlords on rent relief. Uh, landlords, in turn, have their own bills to pay, uh, and so the choice is between deferring uh, or abating rent in many circumstances. Uh, deferring rent is, is likely the better option. Uh, and there are several reasons for this. Uh, the foremost is that accounting rules uh, allow property owners to, to book income when it's deferred rent, uh, but not when it's reduced rent. Uh, in addition, uh, lowering rents uh, has a negative effect on property value and also the landlord or property owner's financial covenants and their own loan obligations. And so that's something that was existing prior to the public health crisis, but it's been exacerbated. Uh, kind of the outlier that we see in commercial real estate is office leasing. Uh, office leasing was doing pretty well before the public health crisis, uh, but now with uh, a seamless transition to working remotely for many white-collar employees, uh, a lot of businesses will reconsider the value of their lease expense. And so we see a domino effect occurring of retailers and, and property owners filing bankruptcy. And again, we see this as an opportunity for uh, distressed asset buyers. Thanks, Ray. Hey, Chris, one, one interesting um, story I saw this morning, is, and I don't know if you don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm also happy to talk about the issue itself. But Kurtz announced that unilaterally they're not going to pay any of their landlords for six months. Um, I don't know if you saw that story, if you had a chance to see it, but that's what I saw this morning. And, and when I read that before I got on this webinar, I'm like, well, how are they going to do that when they're in bankruptcy? Because I believe under the United States bankruptcy laws, they're going to have to pay their rent as it comes due. I don't know if you want to give any thoughts about a large worldwide tenant like a Hertz that holds, you know, probably huge amounts of thousands of leases all throughout the world. They're just saying, we're not going to pay our rent for six months. It's for our own good. Uh, I, I did see that, Ray, and, and it is interesting. And as you pointed out, the bankruptcy code, I believe it's, it requires 60 days of performance under a commercial lease uh, in a Chapter 11 case. And so if I'm representing a landlord in that case, uh, I'm moving quickly for a motion to compel to reject or assume that lease and make the court decide whether uh, it's an equitable decision to keep these um, premises in play uh, without uh, any rent expense being paid. Uh, you hit the nail on the head. I think that's going to be a tough issue for a court, uh, but the statute's quite clear. And so whether the courts use Section 105 uh, to grant relief to debtors in this instance remains to be seen, uh, but I wouldn't bet on it. So, out of interest, Chris, if you were um, representing the client, what position would you be taking? Oh, I, I think you have to appeal to the court on, on an equitable basis that uh, we're in a, a new climate. Uh, maybe you're, you're making a force majeure argument. Uh, maybe you're saying that the only chance that this company has to reorganize and, and the welfare of the thousands of employees it really hinges on being able to defer this rent expense for a time being. And really, it's in the best interest of the landlords as well, because they'd have to mitigate their expenses as well in a breach. And finding new tenants uh, in the normal may be difficult. It's Howard. Uh, Chris, if I can just comment on that. <clears throat> I think this points up the shared problem that both tenants and landlords have. You're not going to replace the huge lot at any airport that currently houses Hertz cars with somebody else. So if the landlord is successful legally, <clears throat> it doesn't really accomplish very much for itself economically. So I think that the notion, and I think this is an important concept, 
of the current health crisis creating shared problems is really important to keep in mind because just because you're the stronger of the two parties in the negotiations or legally doesn't mean you've accomplished anything to help yourself. So I think everybody has to step back a little bit, figure out their legal position, and then consider the economic implications of advancing it. Excellent point, Howard. Interestingly, Howard, this, this came out of our force majeure webinar a couple of weeks ago um, where the discussion was very much around the ripple effects. We've talked about dom domino effects. And there's only so far down that chain you can uh, sue somebody. So it's got to come back to uh, lawyers and businesses looking at the commercial reality and collaborating and working out how to come up with a solution to move things forward in a commercial and other world which has been completely ravaged. Um, so yeah, I think our point is point is fundamental. Um, I've got another question for you, Chris. You see, it was worth it was worth being <coughs> last but, but not least, um, which is companies that have raised money, capital or debt, against shares and or brand value. Can they stop their creditors from filing for insolvency or liquidation <coughs> against them, or would they be counted as unsecured creditors? And that's coming from Sandeep in Bangalore. I, I believe they would be unsecured creditors. Chris, we, we just lost you. Could you repeat the question, Keith? I'm sorry. Sorry. Companies that have raised money against shares and or brand value, can they stop their creditors from filing for insolvency and liquidation against them, or would they be counted as unsecured creditors? Well, I'd imagine they'd be considered unsecured creditors mm -hmm. uh, in this jurisdiction. Yeah. Francisco. No, yeah, just, just want to come back to, to something that I believe is interesting, which is the possibility of um, financing companies in bankruptcy process. Um, I think Howard said that although in the States you have the VIP financing um, companies that have filed for bankruptcy processes will not be eligible for those credit. I think that you said that. And on the opposite side, we have our region, which normally will never grant credit to companies who file for Chapter 11 or, or for bankruptcy processes. And nowadays, the government says that um, will probably um, make the banks to lend money to, the, to those companies. So my, my, my I have, to, I, I mean, I wanted to point out that Probably in our region, we will see sort of DIP financing. And mm -hmm. the question forward is um, whether is it available nowadays in the States or, 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 or you were saying that uh, companies will not be eligible for the, for the subsidized credits. Yes, I was, I was speaking only of the, the federal uh, CARES Act money, the PPP loans. Those, at least by statute, are not available to debtors in bankruptcy. But certainly, and, and I, I represent a number of clients like this, debtor in possession, private debtor in possession financing is readily available. And for, for a number of my clients, it's quite lucrative and quite safe if properly handled and properly, properly underwritten. So there are going to be, there are opportunities now for private debtor in possession financing at very lucrative rates. And for, to, to Chris's point earlier, uh, or maybe it was Ivan's point, there are going to be tremendous opportunities for well-capitalized competitors or investors to acquire assets at very low prices of companies in distressed industries where they can use their funds to acquire assets and uh, use whatever synergies they can create to maximize their value and acquire those assets out of bankruptcy. I, I think you're going to see a lot of bankruptcy sales, a lot of asset sales, Section 363 sales, as we call them in the United States. And um, you'll, you'll, I think that will be a, a very um, 
a very common occurrence in lieu of actually restructuring. And that started earlier. It's going to continue and I think accelerate going forward. Great. Thank you, Howard. Um, we're sort of creeping up towards the hour. Um, I just want to check that there are no final questions coming in from um, our audience. Um, you've got a couple of minutes to do that if you'd like. And maybe just to uh, wrap up, if I can go around the panel with, I suppose, just a, a sort of final observation. Um, I'm not going to ask you for a, a crystal ball view of, of what's coming. Um, but in terms of your observations from a from a legal, a, uh, a commercial, or even a personal perspective, um, maybe we'll leave you to last, Ray, um, and uh, start with you, uh, Ivan. So your your final your final thoughts. My apologies. I'm muted. I was muted. Um, yes. Um, well, I think it's still too early to, to you know, have a completely clear picture when uh, bankruptcies are going and restructurings are going to, to um, flourish, as we expect. Uh, but uh, as I said, I think the countries are trying to delay uh, this curve as much as possible. We are still having the, 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 the fight against the virus, and uh, I don't see that this is still the main topic, at least here in Europe. Um, so, yes, um, I think that, that by the beginning of 2021, uh, the, the, we will have, we will be in the middle of this storm, and uh, and uh, I think that uh, the things are going to develop as as, as we uh, all expect. Okay, so so as everybody really has has touched on, you know, we have seen uh, back to the word unprecedented and an unprecedented amount of governmental, um, I suppose, bailout help, um, whether that's um, the, the Federal Reserve or governments around the world um, intervening um, or putting moratorium on moratoria on uh, bankruptcy laws, as in many countries. So I, I guess what we're in this sort of artificial bubble slightly frozen and uh, until we get That's right and uh, the, the, the governments are yeah go on Ivan okay so um, Francisco your final thoughts well you know Keith I'm an optimistic guy so um, my final thoughts are around I mean we are in a crisis, we are in the perfect storm, um, but anyway, for bankruptcy lawyers, I think that there will be plenty of opportunities, and also, as I told to, to, our, to our clients, there are, I mean, the crisis might be a good opportunity to restructure, not necessarily to go bankrupt or to file for bankruptcy or restructuring processes, but also just to restructure your debts. And, and also to our clients, um, it's certainly a very good opportunity to invest in assets in many sectors of the economy, such as, I mean, tourism. There are plenty of opportunities in that field, and there will be. So, so I think that I, I should be finishing with a very optimistic um, view for the future of uh, bankruptcy lawyers. Thanks, Francisco. Um, Chris, what are your what are your thoughts? Francisco, Francisco said it really well. Um, as attorneys and financial professionals, we have a role uh, to serve to our clients uh, to find value, even in times of crisis. Uh, here we have a crisis, and we have opportunities 
whether it's uh, to team up with a strategic partner or to purchase distressed assets. And so I think that's the takeaway. Uh, there are opportunities to be had here. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. While you're on, a comment from Joseph Moldovan, um, who uh, sounds like he's in Serbia, but is probably one of your colleagues, Chris, um, saying that a note release payments in J. Crew Court yesterday. Um, sorry, in J. Crew Court yesterday denied the landlord's request for payment and extended J. Crew's time for another 60 days. Courts are allowing retail debtors to remain in bankruptcy without paying rent. There we go. Um, thanks, Chris. Howard, the floor is yours, and then Ray will leave you the final word. This is about the third or fourth recession that I've been a bankruptcy lawyer and dealing with since <clears throat> the early 1980s. Most recessions, most economics are somewhat scientific. They have a pattern that's not necessarily entirely predictable, but there's some predictability to them. We have a variable here that we've not experienced before that I think is going to impact the predictability of this economic cycle. There are factors that are very positive in terms of the government's uh, providing liquidity. There are factors that are not favorable with respect to the health aspects of this that may get worse, may not get worse, we don't know. And also, as I said earlier, that our change in personal behavior and how we've changed our personal habits and whether we go back to what we did before. I think that makes this particular recession more difficult to handicap. That being said, as Chris said it very well, for every crisis, there's an opportunity. And well-capitalized companies can profit from what's going on now. To Francisco's comment about preparing without restructuring, going back to your, your uh, lenders, trying to get restructured debt, all of those things I think are on the table because the problems are pervasive and they affect everybody up and down the, the economic chain. So be wise, be smart, be helpful to your clients, show them the opportunities, and I think uh, you'll serve them very well in doing so. Thank you, Howard. Words of wisdom. Ray, last word to you in our last couple of minutes. Sure. Um, you know, listening to Howard early on, he was rattling off the industries that are affected by the current crisis, which range from airlines, hotels, amusement parks, retail, cruises, you know, beauty and fitness, movie theaters, commercial real estate, municipal governments. I mean, the breadth of who's affected here is, is absolutely staggering. Uh, one topic we didn't even get into was the effect on higher education uh, and universities, both in the United States and worldwide, and the effect on people's ability to pay tuitions, what online learning does, the ability to even come back to campus, foreign students being able to come to the United States uh, and matriculating classes here, United States students being able to go on, you know, study abroad programs, it's all impacted. And the economic activity that that engine runs is enormous. But the one observation that I'll make that's very, very different than 2008, 2009, and, and, and going back to the 1980, you know, savings and loan crisis, is two points. Our central banks, both in the United States and worldwide, have stepped up with staggering, you know, multi-trillion U.S. dollar backings and our financial institutions themselves are are generally very healthy. Uh, whereas back in 2008, 2009, you saw hundreds and hundreds of banks fail. In, in, in the teeth of the Great Recession, you don't see that now. So while you see household names such as Hertz or, or Pure One or, or J.C. Penney, you know, filing for bankruptcy, the financial institutions such as Bank of America and J.P. Morgan and other worldwide banks, they're still financially healthy. So that does give me some optimism that, you know, once the health issue passes economically, we'll get through this. And that's probably the last observation that – that's the observation I'll leave you with is that our, our financial institutions are much healthier than they were 12 years ago.